Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Ken Stanley. Um, I became uh, uh, I, I came to know his work through Hypernet, uh, Hypernet because I actually had an implement, uh, implementation of Hypernet uh, in my computer when I was in grad school. Um, he's uh, a professor at computer science in um, University of uh, Central Florida and he's uh, co-founder of the Geometric Intelligence and he now is at Uber uh, at AI Labs. Uh, today he's gonna tell us about uh, his recent work on evolving to learn through synaptic uh, plasticity. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> All right, so evolving to learn through synaptic plasticity. So this is a field I think that uh, is not very well known is the idea of evolving plastic networks. So I want to introduce you to this idea and, and kind of try to motivate why this is interesting. Uh, interesting to think about in general across deep learning. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of motivation though just for why this, this field is something that interested a small group of people. Um, brains in nature are of course a product of evolution, but brains in nature are not static structures. We learn over our lifetimes as do uh, most of the animals with brains. And so if we're using evolution in neural networks, which we sometimes call neuroevolution, to say just solve a problem, like one problem, and then we might say, okay, static structures are okay because we just need the weights to solve the problem, and that's fine. But if we're using neuroevolution to evolve something like a brain, like something that we think is some, somehow analogous to brains we see in nature, then plasticity may be essential. In other words, brains in the sense that they can learn over their lifetime. And that's where the meta-learning concept comes in because brains do learn, but also brains are pro a product of a process that some of us sometimes characterize also as a learning process, which is evolution. So we're definitely talking about meta-learning. Now I say it may be essential to have plasticity because it's true that theoretically a recurrent network, just through cycling activation alone, can also do a kind of a learning over a lifetime. So it may be a, a, somewhat of a topic of, of discussion or debate whether it's essential to have plasticity, but I think what most of us would agree on uh, ultimately if we look at the problem long enough is that in practice probably plasticity will make the search um, greatly more efficient than if you had to rely on only recurrence and we'll see some evidence of that. So well, what are we talking about when we talk about plasticity in practice? Now you could use evolution to discover the delta rule which is basically like the foundation that precedes back propagation and actually this was done in 1990 by David Chalmers who's now like a, actually a well-known philosopher but this was way before that. Um, so this was kind of interesting that he did this but I think that this is not really what we hope to see in this kind of research in the long run because we already know about the delta rule. So we're trying to find something new. Um, and so we're trying to look for what has come to be called local learning rules. Um, and there's a few reasons maybe so I, so I can motivate it a little bit. Like why, why not just use backpropagation in the first place? Backpropagation is itself a kind of plasticity. Well, it, but we're trying to learn how to learn. So we're trying to learn something different than backpropagation. And here's some reasons why. So first of all, the del of course, the delta rule is already known. Um, second thing is not entirely clear whether backprop is biologically plausible. I sure just pasted in here um, a slide from Hinton um, where he said there are three obvious reasons why the brain cannot be doing backpropagation, but that's obviously a topic of uh, a great deal of debate as well, and, and this is not even his own final thought on this. Um, and I think maybe the most important motivation for looking at local learning rules and learning them is because domain-specific learning rules are likely significantly more efficient than generic learning rules, which is what sort of backpropagation or gradient descent would be. It's a generic way of learning anything. But for a specific domain, we may not need all of the power of generic learning. We may need domain-specific types of learning. And that's where speci specifically evolved rules for that specific kind of problem can make learning much more efficient. So let's look at a little more detail what that means. Um, so the question is, what can happen at a synapse? When we talk about a local learning rule, I mean local to a synapse, the kinds of changes that can happen to a weight at a synapse. Well, there's a lot of things that can happen. Weighted signal transmission is the most familiar one. Just give it a weight, and the weight basically modulates the signal. Um, but there's things like strengthening, weakening, sensitization, habituation, Hebbian learning, neuromodulation, and many, many others, basically an infinite number of possible functions that you could perform to change the weight at a synapse. So this leaves this question kind of, well, how should we allow weights to change? And remember, we're going to do meta-learning, so we're going to allow evolution to decide that. So basically, we need to de describe some kind of space of possible learning rules so that evolution could actually design the rules that then decide how, at individual synapses, changes occur over a lifetime. 
And I'm showing you something kind of historical here, which is um, a set of rules proposed by Blinell and Floriano, and Floriano was a kind of a pioneer in this area going back to the 90s of evolving plasticity. Um, and he's proposed basically this set of rules, which is not necessarily definitive in any way, this is just sort of a proposed set of rules, um, that could be assigned at a synapse and also could have a learning rate assigned to the rules so that basically that learning rate could even go down to zero, which would mean that the synapse is static. And so we could decide within a large network um, what the different uh, plasticity rules should be. So like in this Floriano encoding, um, it was very simple. Like you could basically say, there's a couple bits that tell you what rule you have, and this is for a particular connection, and there's a couple of bits that tell you the learning rate, and that will then define what happens at the synapse. Um, and so this is a classic experiment just to kind of illustrate what this is about. Um, and this is a, a, a fairly large, at the time, recurrent neural network. So this is just a, a depiction of a recurrent neural network. But every one of those connections has an evolved plasticity rule. And so the task here is just this robot has to go over to this side. And if it gets over here, then it switches on a light. Then it has to go back and, and stand under the light. So it's a very simple task. And it's almost not a learning task, except there, you might think that there's a little bit of learning, sort of, when it gets over here and switches the light, which is that it basically has to decide, remember that it did that, so now it has a new goal, which is to go to the light. And so there's a policy change in mid-task. And in theory, if you reconfigure your weights, at the time you do the policy change, it's kind of like remembering where you are, and then you change your policy um, all at once. Of course, this can also be attempted through recurrence alone, so not having plasticity. But what's interesting is qualitatively, if you look at the trajectories of individuals who are evolved with plasticity and without plasticity, both of them are recurrent networks, but one has plasticity at the synapses, um, they're just qualitatively very different. So like the, the, the synaptic plasticity version of the network has um, sort of a much more intuitive trajectory where it just turns around simply uh, when it switches on the light and goes back to the other side, so it reconfigures it ne its network. Whereas recurrence does something weird, which is this kind of loop-to-loop -loop pattern, which is it's sort of like cheating. Like it just bounces around sort of and gets lucky, gets over here, and then sort of bounces around until it gets to the other side. So it doesn't really have a, a, like a definitive task switch that happens. And it gives you a little bit of hint. It doesn't prove anything, but that there's something interesting that happens when we actually learn rules for plasticity. Um, now, we have found, like there were experiments uh, a long time ago with NEAT, where, like for example, with food foraging, where some food is poison and some is not, and you have to remember which is which, that actually we found recurrence alone did do better uh, than evolving plasticity, um, which kind of triggers some of this uncertainty about like why is it essential to have plasticity? We do have plasticity in our brains, but could there have been something like a human brain without plasticity and just only recurrence? Um, but I think almost surely plasticity matters in general. Um, because the size of the networks that you would need to have if it was only through recurrence to do the kinds of memory-based tasks that we can do would be just astronomically larger, most likely, and therefore plasticity as a practical matter is probably essential. So now what I want to just kind of show you is how does thinking develop over time in this field? Um, and so like what I've shown you is very simple stuff, just evolving rules like Hebbian rules, sensitization rules, at synapses. Um, so where do you go with this? Like what, what actually would be like new ideas that would progress forward so we can do more and evolve more uh, sophisticated systems, learning systems? And one important thing that, that I think Andreas Otagio um, helped to popularize within neuroevolution, he didn't invent this idea, but he popularized it within this area, is neuromodulated plasticity. And the idea here is that you have something called a neuromodulatory neuron, which like is highlighted here in blue, which is special. It's a special kind of a neuron. And basically what it does is it modulates the level of plasticity of other neurons. So this, this neuron is in effect telling this neuron, okay, your incoming connections are either more or less plastic depending on the level of output that's coming out of me. And um, this can be formalized here, but I won't go through the equations, but it's pretty uh, hopefully intuitive that this can modulate the plasticity here. And this is really nice because this is basically like knowing when to change. And one of the sort of um, frustrating things about synaptic plasticity is just it continues happening if you don't, if you don't have any way to stop it uh, throughout forever. Um, but, but in reality, like sometimes you get into a situation and you just want to lock it in. Like, okay, that's where the food is in the maze. Let's remember that. Let's stop being plastic. And neuromodulation can kind of lock in memories and do things like that. And then it can also unlock them. Like if it's say we found out that the world changed and say, okay, we need to be plastic again, be flexible, and then start changing our view. Um, and so it sort of moves to RL-like capabilities. So if you think about it, neuromodulation can be thought of almost like as a proxy for a reward. Like something good happens and then we need to modulate our plasticity 
um, either up modulate or maybe you need to down modulate it, depending on the situation, in reaction to the reward. So it's kind of interesting. We're using low level mechanisms here to walk gradually towards a more reinforcement learning like scenario. And so, in that spirit, like what was popular in this area was to evolve what were called T mazes. Um, and these were like rats in a maze that would be looking for some, some food and if it goes to the wrong part of the maze it would, it would basically get a very low reward but if it could go to the right part and get the food get a high reward and the idea was it should, we should evolve a brain that can explore the maze but if it finds the food then it should in any other subsequent trial just go straight to the food and not do any more exploring so it needs to remember where it found it and the only mechanism that it has available um, is the synaptic plasticity and we could also, once again, alternatively try recurrence um, alone. We don't have to use plasticity in theory. Um, but it was found that um, plasticity makes it much easier um, to evolve networks that uh, solve this task effectively. And you can create increasingly complicated T mazes, like this is another picture of this kind of a thing, to show that like, as they get more and more complicated, it becomes more and more important to have plasticity to be able to perform a task like this. And so the neuromodulation is the lock-in, so like when the, when the when the agent finds the reward, then the, the neuromodulation will sort of lock in the memory of where that reward was and then it can go back to that place in the future. Um, and so this is actually, it was interesting to me to see um, Peter Abiel's uh, keynote yesterday where he showed something very similar to these T mazes, um, but it was done through reinforcement learning, it's kind of meta-learning through reinforcement learning. I believe he'll be speaking later at the symposium. Um, and it's interesting that in the history of this area, these, this is a very common thing to do to kind of evolve these guys to run through mazes and learn how to learn inside of mazes using plasticity. So there's certainly some analogy to recent work in reinforcement learning. Um, so, just giving you a little sense of some other ideas that I think are interesting, uh, Andrea Sotagio, who I mentioned before, he came and visited my lab in around 2012 and he had this idea for a new kind of uh, uh, plasticity which he called reconfigure and saturate that we worked on there. Um, and the idea here was that let's use neural noise as, the expo as an exploration mechanism and then use weight saturation as a way of getting stability. And so like modulation can lead to saturation in a weight and that will allow us to effectively lock in. But, so like this is, a, this is a neuromodulatory pattern. This isn't a, any particular interesting task, but it just shows when neuromodulation is high, we like lock in the weight of a connection at some level. But as when neuromodulation is turned off, the weights kind of gradually sink back to a random fluctuation, and so this is a form of exploration. And so in this case, noise is driving exploration. So the idea is here to move towards a situation where we could just kind of learn uh, through ex active exploration in a domain um, with reinforcement learning like signals. Um, and uh, this is the domain where this was tested, where this agent was running around uh, gathering food particles that could either be poison or not. But whether type A or type B was poison would switch in the middle, and that's where the learning curve just dies over here. But then it quickly picks up again because the reconfigure and saturate neuron sinks back to a level of just weight fluctuation, so it's basically exploring new policies until it starts to then lock in again on an effective policy after the switch. So basically showed that this is something that can um, dynamically learn a task on the fly. There's the idea of using indirect encoding to encode plasticity rules. This is basically an idea in neuroevolution of using one network to encode the weights of another. Um, it was recently used in gradient descent also through things called uh, uh, DPPNs and hypernets, um, some, some terms you may have heard, but orig it originated with hypernet. And the idea is that if we can use one network to encode a pattern of weights, in other words, this network outputs a weight for this connection and all the other connections in a network, then we can output a pattern of learning rules. So that would allow us to basically paint a pattern of rules over a huge network. So like imagine that every light level here is a different rule as opposed to a different weight. And this is a pattern output by one of these pattern producing networks. Then we would create sort of brain-like structures with huge complicated but, but um, principled and regular patterns of rules. And each rule could be very complex, have a very complex kind of function surface for how it act, acts and we can then uh, evolve very complex learning systems. Now the last thing I wanted to mention to you was something that uh, we're going to present tomorrow at the workshop on meta learning, um, and, uh, and you can see it at a poster spotlight if you do happen to be interested. And it, it's sort of a natural progression, which we see often, which is this idea that, hey, well, you're evolving all this stuff, like all these learning rules. Um, what if we just tried to pass a gradient back through it? Um, and so uh, this is about backpropagated plasticity. So it's still the meta learning, but we substitute backpropagation for evolution. Um, and this is work I did with my colleague uh, Thomas McConey and also Jeff Kloon at Uber AI Labs. 
Um, and the idea is that we could adjust the plasticity parameters by gradient descent between lifetimes, and therefore we can actually take advantage of gradient information in order to get the right rules. Um, and this allowed us to get plastic networks with millions of parameters, um, and they actually became very good at, we tried image reconstruction, and what was interesting, I think, was that we learned that these plastic networks are much better than other kinds of recurrent networks in this particular domain. So like if you look at these learning curves, you can see a regular recurrent network can't even learn. An LSTM does eventually learn, but much slower than the blue curve, which is this plastic recurrent network where the plasticity rules are evolved, which learns almost immediately to do the task and almost perfectly. Um, and so what the task was like image reconstruction, which means we would show it during the learning phase. The meta-learning phase is to learn how to do this, but we'd show it a sequence of images and then show one that was incomplete and would have to reconstruct that image. And what was interesting is the coefficients of plasticity, which are shown here, which is very hard to see, but they actually have structure. So it's not like just a uniform set of the same rule everywhere, which you might guess. But it was actually structured, specifically tailored to this problem to be good at it, and we tried versions of the network that were um, not, uh, that were uniform and that weren't learned through, uh, through plasticity, or where the plasticity rules weren't learned through meta-learning, and it was significantly worse. So basically you need this structure to get the best performance, and we were able to get it. So I think it's very intriguing to, to think about the idea um, that plasticity inside of gradient descent, which is very uh, little explored, if at all, um, is really probably viable for certain kinds of tasks and maybe actually the best approach, um, even over and above what you can do with just recurrent or, or state-of-the-art types of recurrent structures. So in conclusion, there's a wide scope for creativity in this area. Um, endless kinds of plasticity can be evolved. Um, there's a lot of biological inspiration. And domain-specific learning mechanisms are, are much less studied um, than domain general. Um, and so this could be important for certain domains, like learning to walk quickly on new terrain. Like, you don't need all of the apparatus of learning to just get better at doing some one specific thing that's related to your general expertise anyway. Um, and finally, I think it's nice to see cross-pollination between different areas. I think it's very natural often that things that originate in evolution where you have a sandbox, which is in some ways much less constrained because you don't have to be differentiable to eventually cross-pollinate into some things like more conventional deep learning um, once we get a handle on how these kinds of mechanisms work. Um, so thanks, and if you're interested in more, you can find me at these places, thanks. <clears throat> We have three minutes for questions. So I guess I uh, guess I can ask a question. Um, so um, have you compared, um, I guess, a neural net architecture with plasticity with a different neural net that doesn't have? Plasticity, but the activities may actually depend on, say, um, you know, other uh, neurons, because um, there seems to be an equivalence there. Because um, you can always kind of simulate um, like a weight that has zero weight with like low activity at that particular neuron. So I, actually, I don't know if I completely followed like what you want to compare. Like, it, uh -huh. is a neural network with plasticity right. with a neural network that does what exactly? So essentially, you can think of uh, like the plasticity as essentially modulating the uh, the activations of the neural nets, right? Say in that recurrent setting. Um, so, for example, uh, at different time steps, you would have uh, different activations at different units, and that would basically correspond to kind of modulating the uh, like whether the uh, neural net itself is uh, like actually uh, varying, like in terms of its connections. <coughs> but I mean, uh, like you can all, always think of, you know, something where the weight connection can change as, you know, something that's fully connected, but you're basically changing uh, the weights themselves. Um, but, I mean, if you haven't done the comparison, that's fine. No, no, I, 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 I don't think I have done it, but I, I think, uh, or I don't, I'm not aware of anyone doing that uh, or looking into that. Um, but I'd, I think it would probably be useful for me to talk more with you uh, sure. okay. to understand sure. what, how to do that comparison okay, in the right sure. way. All right.